Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, if there's one thing we've learned when filming Wild Kingdom, it's that nature can be harsh. Not all animals are strong and healthy enough to survive. In tonight's episode, we'll explore the relationship between predators and prey. Each plays an important role in keeping animal populations in check. The old and sickly animals are naturally weeded out, leaving the strong and healthy to produce the next generation. In fact, birds of prey like this owl are only successful about 50% of their attempts to catch food in the wild. This reality can seem harsh, but it's absolutely necessary to create that delicate, yet natural balance of animals in the wild kingdom. So sit back and relax and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. The Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area in Idaho has the largest concentrations of prairie falcons and golden eagles in the world. Yet, even though these two birds are abundant, the possibility of extinction looms. These birds live in the canyon, but hunt on the high plateaus above. Now, some agricultural interests want to irrigate and farm that plateau land, but it's feared this may be detrimental to the wildlife, especially to the Townsend ground squirrel, which is the principal prey of the prairie falcon. In a unique scientific program, the Bureau of Land Management for Idaho is trying to determine beforehand whether or not some of the land might be farmed. And in this, it has enlisted the aid of scientists in an effort to find the answers. We were invited to observe that program, which was occurring here in southwestern Idaho in the canyon of the Snake River. This was where the future eventually was to be decided for the Snake River Birds of Prey. The Snake River Canyon, winding its way sinuously through the arid terrain of southwestern Idaho, is ideal habitat for birds of prey. Here, the poetry in motion flight of the eagles, such as this immature golden eagle, is a common sight, but always breathtaking in its gracefulness. On the very rim of this canyon is a dedication plaque which according to Bill Matthews, director of the Bureau of Land Management for Idaho, proclaims this to be one of America's most important wildlife habitats, the Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area. Its 26,000 acres, dedicated in 1971, stretch 33 miles along the Snake River. Now, these magnificent birds of prey may be threatened by encroaching agricultural development since they hunt on the plateaus high above the river, which is where farming is proposed. Not all of the predators of the Snake River Valley would be affected by farming. Bobcats hunt in the canyon for such prey as chipmunks, and farming on the plateaus above does not necessarily diminish their food sources. That's not the case, unfortunately, with the beautiful prairie falcon. This grand species of western falcon shares with the golden eagle the distinction of being more abundant here than anywhere else on Earth. These two species of birds of prey are disrupted from their habitat here. Extinction for them would become possible. They hunt very little among the cliffs or in the river valley. The Snake River Canyon provides them ideal roosting and nesting sites, and its thermal air currents are superb for hours of effortless soaring. Their principal prey live on the gentle slopes and flatter land of the plateaus. 
So that's where these winged predators must go to hunt. It is here that the golden eagle seeks the jackrabbit. Sometimes the eagle eats smaller mammals, but the real mainstay of its diet is the jackrabbit, and that's the animal it hunts almost exclusively on the sage-grown plateaus. Another important predator here is the badger, but it seldom catches rabbit. It's more interested in the Townsend ground squirrel. Like a smaller version of the familiar prairie dog of the West, the Townsend ground squirrels live in large underground colonies. Eagles feed on them only rarely, but the badgers here prey on them heavily and compete strongly for them with the prairie falcon. That's where much of the problem lies. The prairie falcon is a highly specialized hunter with highly specialized needs. It feeds almost exclusively on Townsend ground squirrels. If these ground squirrels are eliminated in this area because of agricultural development, then the prairie falcon will also disappear. In fact, such development might also adversely affect the badgers and the golden eagles and all other predators of the area. Bill Matthews says the Bureau of Land Management is very concerned. That's why the scientists here are conducting a special in-depth study. Dr. Tom Dunstan of Western Illinois University is one of those specialists who is trying to determine how much land can be put into agricultural use without becoming detrimental to the birds of prey here in the Snake River natural area. Most seriously affected is the prairie falcon because of its food limitations. Since it feeds almost exclusively on Townsend ground squirrels, its survival hinges strongly on the survival of the ground squirrels. Therefore, the research here must be as intensive into the effect of agricultural development on the ground squirrels as it is a study into the habits and needs of the predatory birds themselves. In order to save the falcons, the ground squirrels must be preserved. We next traveled with Dr. Dunstan to the area where the research on ground squirrels was being conducted on the plateau, a short distance from the rim of the canyon. It is very important to learn how the conversion of this normally arid terrain into sugar beet farms through irrigation will affect the multitude of ground squirrels living here. That's the specialty of another scientist working for the Bureau of Land Management. Associated with the University of Idaho, Wayne Melquist has been radio monitoring ground squirrel activities. Telemetry collars have been put on selected animals and their movements can be traced through the radio signals which are broadcast. There's the ground squirrel that's been broadcasting the signal we've been receiving here. The burrow area of these animals has been marked by Melquist into a staked out grid pattern. This is one of three such grid areas under study. Melquist puts telemetry collars on the dominant male and female ground squirrels within each specific grid area. The animals are not at all difficult to catch since they have no real fear of the traps. Traps are baited with apple, which the ground squirrel simply cannot resist. Most become apple addicts, allowing themselves to be caught repeatedly. The first time one is caught, it's given a numbered ear tag. Repeated capturings then reveal facts regarding movement and other life history information. Wayne Melquist keeps very careful track of exactly where and when each ground squirrel is caught. 
He's pleased to discover that this one just caught has no collar. It's probably one of the only animals left in the area that hasn't been collared before. Now one can be attached, and when the animal is released, the pulses broadcast from the collar will disclose its movements. From this can be determined quite accurately the range a ground squirrel requires in order to live ideally. Once the new collar is attached, I'll check the signal from here. At his truck, Melquist will anesthetize the ground squirrel he's just captured, aided by Dr. Dunstan. We are using, as an anesthetizing agent, surgical ether. It is applied liberally to a cotton swab, which in turn is tossed into a plastic bag, into which we'll introduce the ground squirrel. The value of knowing the habits and ranging movements of the ground squirrel is extremely important. We know, for example, that these ground squirrels refuse to live in areas where farming is occurring. That's because sugar beet farming changes the soil, so it can no longer produce Eurotia, the principal food plant of the ground squirrel. If the Eurotia grass dies off, a chain reaction results. The squirrels will have nothing to eat and they will die. And if the squirrels die, then the principal food source of the prairie falcon will be gone, and the birds will die. After the squirrel is weighed, the radio telemetry collar will be placed around its neck, and from that time on, the movements and behavior of the animal can be studied closely. All the trapped squirrels are marked with metal ear tags, like this. Further trapping, which shows population decrease, indicates how many ground squirrels are being taken by the falcons. Thus, by use of both the ear tagging to establish population levels and telemetry to establish ranges, we are able to calculate exactly the normal ground squirrel conditions which must be maintained to adequately support the prairie falcon population. Soldering the collar around the neck completes the circuit, activating transmission of the radio signal. The signal emanates from a tiny but powerful telemetry transmitter in the collar at the throat area, and it broadcasts a continuous pulsating signal for about 55 days. This signal is picked up by our monitoring equipment. Marlin's signal assures us that everything's fine. So now we'll return the ground squirrel to where it was captured and release it. The signal being broadcast by the mercury battery powered collar transmitter will tell us with great accuracy exactly where this particular ground squirrel is at any given time, whether above ground or below. As time after time its movements are monitored, its full individual range can be clearly established. With these determinations made, overall projections will show how large a hunting area must be preserved for the falcons. Another facet of the comprehensive research occurring here includes the radio tracking of large mammalian predators. One of our researchers from the University of Idaho, John Messick, is studying the needs of the badger in regard to prey. When his findings are correlated with the findings of the other scientists on this project, it will help the Bureau of Land Management reach a sound decision on land use here.
Leaving the land idle may be the necessary price to pay in order to maintain this exceptional area in a proper state for the wildlife which lives here. Another facet of the research by the scientists of the Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area required that we capture an adult prairie falcon. Tracing the activities of the Townsend ground squirrel is important to the research being done here at the Snake River Birds of Prey Natural Area. But of equal interest are the activities of the prairie falcon. And that study is the special province of the falcon expert whose work here has been so extensive, Dr. Dunstan. Our falcon trapper is Morley Nelson who is also the project's advisor and consultant. He has selected this spot to work now because it is close to where the ground squirrel colony is located and where falcons often hunt. Morley will try to catch a falcon using this mounted Townsend ground squirrel as a decoy. The decoy is positioned on a little battery-powered turntable which will keep it moving slowly around. The movement is what will attract the attention of any passing prairie falcon. Nooses of strong monofilament line are held in place by the little jacket. The nooses attached to the decoy and those attached to wires which Morley Nelson is positioning around the decoy now are what will eventually snare any bird of prey which swoops down to strike the decoy with its sharply taloned feet. The nooses will tighten around the bird's feet and hold it fast, but without harm. The rotation of the decoy is perfect, and everything is in readiness now. Morley will now move a considerable distance away and take a hiding place in a convenient cluster of the underbrush, from where he can watch closely and be prepared to move quickly. There's a prairie falcon now, and it's obviously on the hunt. It's not unexpected that the falcon's first move at the slowly turning decoy is just a pass to look it over. It'll probably make another pass like that before deciding to strike. We have him, and now before he can injure himself in his struggles, Morley Nelson will get him under control and place a hood over his head to quiet him. The bird's fairly well in hand now and Morley will continue holding it while I remove the monofilament loops from its legs and prepare to attach the radio telemetry transmitter.
The radio telemetry units we use signal continuously for seven months. The telemetry unit allows us to follow this falcon during his hunting flights and helps us determine the hunting area which must be reserved. So that it will interfere with neither flight nor breeding, we have designed the unit so that the antenna lies neatly down the length of the bird's back. Now we'll check to see if the transmitter on the bird is broadcasting properly. The signal's coming in perfectly. Dr. Dunstan and Morley have finished with this falcon. It can now be set free, and whenever they need to know where it is, they can locate its signal. They'll soon learn how much time each day the falcon spends hunting, and exactly where. The answers the Bureau of Land Management is seeking are not yet all in, and no decision has yet been made. While continuing to keep an open mind to all arguments, pro and con, the Bureau of Land Management remains most interested in maintaining the best possible natural conditions for the Snake River birds of prey. It is heartening to see the work being done by scientists in trying to determine the needs of the predators. The Snake River area study is unique in that a serious attempt is being made to find answers before the rights are granted to turn the desert plateaus into irrigated fields. All too often in the past, permissions have been granted without such adequate preliminary studies, and damage has been caused which cannot be rectified. Next week in part two of Snake River Birds of Prey, we'll observe the scientists as they climb down the cliffs to study and mark the fledgling eagles and prairie falcons. And we'll participate in a novel capture of a golden eagle. This project is a superb example of how man is really striving to protect and preserve the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.